Dwight David Ike Eisenhower was an American politician and decorated military general who served as the 34th President of the United States from 1953 until 1961. He was a five-star general in the United States Army during World War II and served as Supreme Commander of the Allied Expeditionary Forces in Europe. He was responsible for planning and supervising the invasion of North Africa in Operation Torch in 1942, 43 and the successful invasion of France and Germany in 1944, 45 from the Western Front. In 1951, he became the first Supreme Commander of NATO. Eisenhower was of mostly Pennsylvania Dutch ancestry and was raised in a large family in Kansas by parents with a strong religious background. He graduated from West Point in 1915 and later married Mamie Dowd, with whom he had two sons. After World War II, Eisenhower served as Army Chief of Staff under President Harry S. Truman and then accepted the post of President at Columbia University. Eisenhower entered the 1952 presidential race as a Republican to counter the non-interventionism of Senator Robert A. Taft, campaigning against communism, Korea and corruption. Quote, he won in a landslide, defeating Democratic candidate Adlai Stevenson and temporarily upending the New Deal coalition. Eisenhower was the first U.S. president to be constitutionally term-limited under the 22nd Amendment and the only president born before the 20th century to be subject to term limits. Eisenhower's main goals in office were to keep pressure on the Soviet Union and reduce federal deficits. In the first year of his presidency, he threatened the use of nuclear weapons in an effort to conclude the Korean War. His New Look policy of nuclear deterrence prioritized inexpensive nuclear weapons while reducing funding for conventional military forces. He ordered coups in Iran and Guatemala. Eisenhower gave major aid to help the French in the First Indochina War, and after the French were defeated he gave strong financial support to the new state of South Vietnam. Congress agreed to his request in 1955 for the Formosa Resolution, which obliged the U.S. to militarily support capitalist Taiwan and continue the isolation of the People's Republic of China. After the Soviet Union launched Sputnik in 1957, Eisenhower authorized the establishment of NASA, which led to the space race. During the Suez Crisis of 1956, Eisenhower condemned the Israeli, British and French invasion of Egypt, and forced them to withdraw. He also condemned the Soviet invasion during the Hungarian Revolution of 1956 but took no action. Eisenhower sent 15 U.S. troops to Lebanon to prevent the pro-Western government from falling to a Nasser-inspired revolution during the 1958 Lebanon crisis. Near the end of his term, his efforts to set up a summit meeting with the Soviets collapsed because of the U-2 incident. In his January 17, 1961 farewell address to the nation, Eisenhower expressed his concerns about the dangers of massive military spending, particularly deficit spending in government contracts to private military manufacturers, and coined the term military-industrial complex. On the domestic front, he covertly opposed Joseph McCarthy and contributed to the end of McCarthyism by openly invoking executive privilege. He otherwise left most political activity to his vice president, Richard Nixon. Eisenhower was a moderate conservative who continued New Deal agencies and expanded Social Security. He also launched the Interstate Highway System, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, the establishment of strong science education via the National Defense Education Act and encouraged peaceful use of nuclear power via amendments to the Atomic Energy Act. Eisenhower's two terms saw considerable economic prosperity except for a minor decline in 1958, voted Gallup's most admired man 12 times. He achieved widespread popular esteem both in and out of office. 
Since the late 20th century, consensus among Western scholars has consistently held Eisenhower as one of the greatest U.S. presidents. Early Life and Education The Eisenhower, German for Iron Hewer, Miner, family migrated from Carlsbrunn in the Saarland to North America, first settling in York, Pennsylvania, in 1741, and in the 1880s moving to Kansas. Hans's great-great-grandson, David Jacob Eisenhower, was Eisenhower's father and was a college-educated engineer. Despite his own father Jacob's urging to stay on the family farm, Eisenhower's mother, Ida Elizabeth Stover, Eisenhower, born in Virginia, of German Protestant ancestry, moved to Kansas from Virginia. She married David on September 23, 1885, in LeCompton, Kansas, on the campus of their alma mater, Lane University. David owned a general store in Hope, Kansas, but the business failed due to economic conditions and the family became impoverished. The Eisenhowers then lived in Texas from 1889 until 1892, and later returned to Kansas. With $24 to their name at the time, David worked as a mechanic with a railroad and then with a creamery. Eisenhower was born on October 14, 1890, in Denison, Texas, the third of seven boys. In 1892, the family moved to Abilene, Kansas, which Eisenhower considered his hometown. While Eisenhower's mother was against war, it was her collection of history books that first sparked Eisenhower's early and lasting interest in military history. He persisted in reading the books in her collection and became a voracious reader in the subject. Other favorite subjects early in his education were arithmetic and spelling. His parents set aside specific times at breakfast and at dinner for daily family Bible reading. Chores were regularly assigned and rotated among all the children, and misbehavior was met with unequivocal discipline. Usually from David, Eisenhower attended Abilene High School and graduated with the class of 1909. Edgar took the first turn at school, and White was employed as a night supervisor at the Bell Springs Creamery. At West Point, Eisenhower relished the emphasis on traditions and on sports, but was less enthusiastic about the hazing, though he willingly accepted it as a plebe. He was also a regular violator of the more detailed regulations, and finished school with a less than stellar discipline rating. Academically, Eisenhower's best subject by far was English, otherwise, his performance was average, though he thoroughly enjoyed the typical emphasis of engineering on science and mathematics. In athletics, Eisenhower later said that, not making the baseball team at West Point was one of the greatest disappointments of my life, maybe my greatest. Eisenhower later served as junior varsity football coach and cheerleader. At West Point he played football which became known as the class the stars fell on, because 59 members eventually became general officers. Personal Life Eisenhower met Mamie Geneva Dowd of Boone, Iowa, while he was stationed in Texas. The Eisenhowers had two sons. Dowd Dwight Ecke Eisenhower was born September 24, 1917, and died of scarlet fever on January 2, 1921, at the age of three, married Richard Nixon's daughter Julie in 1968. Eisenhower was a golf enthusiast later in life, and joined the Augusta National Golf Club in 1948. After golf, oil painting was Eisenhower's second hobby. Angels in the Outfield was Eisenhower's favorite movie. World War I After graduation in 1915, Second Lieutenant Eisenhower requested an assignment in the Philippines, which was denied. He served initially in logistics and then the infantry at various camps in Texas and Georgia until 1918. In 1916, while stationed at Fort Sam Houston, Eisenhower was football coach for St. Louis College, now St. Mary's University. In late 1917, 
while in charge of training at F.T. Oglethorpe in Georgia. His wife Mamie had their first son. When the U.S. entered World War I, he immediately requested an overseas assignment but was again denied and then assigned to F.T. Leavenworth, Kansas. Once again his spirits were raised when the unit under his command received orders overseas to France. This time his wishes were thwarted when the armistice was signed a week before his departure date. In service of generals Eisenhower, far right, with three unidentified men in 1919, four years after graduating from West Point. After the war, Eisenhower reverted to his regular rank of captain and a few days later was promoted to major, a rank he held for 16 years. He assumed duties again at Camp Mead, Maryland, commanding a battalion of tanks, where he remained until 1922. His schooling continued, focused on the nature of the next war and the role of the tank in it. His new expertise in tank warfare was strengthened by a close collaboration with George S. Patton, Serena E. Brett, and other senior tank leaders. Their leading-edge ideas of speed-oriented offensive tank warfare were strongly discouraged by superiors, who considered the new approach too radical and preferred to continue using tanks in a strictly supportive role for the infantry. Eisenhower was even threatened with court-martial for continued publication of these proposed methods of tank deployment and he relented. From 1920, Eisenhower served under a succession of talented generals. Question mark. Fox Connor, John J. Pershing, Douglas MacArthur and George Marshall. He first became executive officer to General Connor in the Panama Canal Zone, where, joined by Mamie, he served until 1924. Under Connor's tutelage, he studied military history and theory, including Karl von Clausewitz's On War, and later cited Connor's enormous influence on his military thinking, saying in 1962 that Fox Connor was the ablest man I ever knew. Connor's comment on Eisenhower was, quote, He then served as a battalion commander at Fort Benning, Georgia, until 1927. During the late 1920s and early 1930s, Eisenhower's career in the post-war army stalled some with, as military priorities diminished. Many of his friends resigned for high-paying business jobs. He was assigned to the American Battle Monuments Commission directed by General Pershing, and with the help of his brother Milton Eisenhower, then a journalist at the Agriculture Department, he produced a guide to American battlefields in Europe. His primary duty was planning for the next war, which proved most difficult in the midst of the Great Depression. In 1935, he accompanied MacArthur to the Philippines, where he served as assistant military advisor to the Philippine government in developing their army. Eisenhower had strong philosophical disagreements with his patron regarding the role of the Philippine Army in the leadership qualities that an American Army officer should exhibit and develop in his subordinates. The dispute and resulting antipathy between Eisenhower and MacArthur lasted the rest of their lives. Historians have concluded that this assignment provided valuable preparation for handling the challenging personalities of Winston Churchill, George S. Patton, George Marshall, and General Montgomery during World War II. Eisenhower later emphasized that too much had been made of the disagreements with MacArthur, and that a positive relationship endured. Eisenhower returned to the United States in December 1939 and was assigned as commanding officer, CO, of the 1st Battalion, 15th Infantry Regiment at Fort Lewis, Washington, later becoming the regimental executive officer. In March 1941 he was promoted to colonel and assigned as chief of staff of the newly activated X Corps under Major General Kenyon Joyce. In June 1941, he was appointed chief of staff to General Walter Kruger, commander of the 3rd Army, at Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio, Texas, 
After successfully participating in the Louisiana maneuvers, he was promoted to Brigadier General on October 3, 1941, although his administrative abilities had been noticed. On the eve of the American entry into World War II he had never held an active command above a battalion and was far from being considered by many as a potential commander of major operations. World War II After the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, Eisenhower was assigned to the General Staff in Washington, where he served until June 1942 with responsibility for creating the major war plans to defeat Japan and Germany. He was appointed Deputy Chief in charge of Pacific Defenses under the Chief of War Plans Division, WPD, General Leonard T. Giro, and then succeeded Giro as Chief of the War Plans Division. Next, he was appointed Assistant Chief of Staff in charge of the New Operations Division, which replaced WPD, under Chief of Staff General George C. Marshall who spotted talent and promoted accordingly. At the end of May 1942, Eisenhower accompanied L.T. Gen. Henry H. Arnold, commanding general of the Army Air Forces, to London to assess the effectiveness of the theater commander in England. Maj. Gen. James E. Cheney, he returned to Washington on June 3rd with a pessimistic assessment stating he had an uneasy feeling about Cheney and his staff. On June 23, 1942, he returned to London as Commanding General, European Theatre of Operations, ETO USA, based in London and with a house on Coombe, Kingston upon Thames. He was promoted to Lieutenant General on July 7. Operations Torch and Avalanche in November 1942, he was also appointed Supreme Commander Allied Expeditionary Force of the North African Theater of Operations, NATO USA, through the new Operational Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force Headquarters, A, E, F, H, Q. The word expeditionary was dropped soon after his appointment for security reasons. French cooperation was deemed necessary to the campaign, and Eisenhower encountered a preposterous situation with the multiple rival factions in France. His primary objective was to move forces successfully into Tunisia, and intending to facilitate that objective, he gave his support to Francois Darlin as High Commissioner in North Africa. Despite Darlin's previous high offices of state in Vichy France and his continued role as commander-in-chief of the French armed forces, the Allied leaders were thunderstruck by this from a political standpoint. Though none of them had offered Eisenhower guidance with the problem in the course of planning the operation, Eisenhower was severely criticized for the move. Darlin was assassinated on December 24 by Fernand Bonnier de la Chapelle. Eisenhower did not take action to prevent the arrest and extrajudicial execution of Bonnier de la Chapelle by associates of Darlin acting without authority from either Vichy or the Allies, considering it a criminal rather than a military matter. Operation Torch also served as a valuable training ground for Eisenhower's combat command skills. During the initial phase of General Feldmarschall Erwin Rommel's move into the Kasserine Pass, Eisenhower created some confusion in the ranks by some interference with the execution of battle plans by his subordinates. He also was initially indecisive in his removal of Lloyd Fredendahl, commanding U.S. Second Corps. He became more adroit in such matters in later campaigns. In February 1943, his authority was extended as commander of AFHQ across the Mediterranean Basin to include the British Eighth Army, commanded by General Sir Bernard Montgomery. The Eighth Army had advanced across the western desert from the east and was ready for the start of the Tunisia campaign. Eisenhower gained his fourth star and gave up command of ETO USA to become commander of NATO USA. After the capitulation of Axis forces in North Africa, Eisenhower oversaw the highly successful invasion of Sicily, 
Once Mussolini, the Italian leader, had fallen in Italy, the Allies switched their attention to the mainland with Operation Avalanche. But while Eisenhower argued with President Roosevelt and British Prime Minister Churchill, who both insisted on unconditional terms of surrender in exchange for helping the Italians, the Germans pursued an aggressive build-up of forces in the country. The Germans made the already tough battle more difficult by adding 19 divisions and initially outnumbering the Allied forces 2 to 1. Nevertheless, the invasion of Italy was highly successful for the Allied commanders. Supreme Allied Commander and Operation Overlord Eisenhower speaks with men of the 502nd Parachute Infantry Regiment, part of the 101st Airborne Division. On June 5, 1944, the day before the D-Day invasion, in December 1943, President Roosevelt decided that Eisenhower, question mark, not Marshall, would be Supreme Allied Commander in Europe. The following month, he resumed command of ETO USA and the following month was officially designated as the Supreme Allied Commander of the Allied Expeditionary Force. SHAEF, serving in a dual role until the end of hostilities in Europe in May 1945. He was charged in these positions with planning and carrying out the Allied assault on the coast of Normandy in June 1944 under the codename Operation Overlord, the liberation of Western Europe and the invasion of Germany. From left, front row includes Army officers Simpson, Patton, Spatz, Eisenhower, Bradley, Hodges and Giroux in 1945. Eisenhower, as well as the officers and troops under him, had learned valuable lessons in their previous operations, and their skills had all strengthened in preparation for the next most difficult campaign against the Germans, a beach landing assault. His first struggles, however, were with Allied leaders and officers on matters vital to the success of the Normandy invasion. He argued with Roosevelt over an essential agreement with de Gaulle to use French resistance forces in covered and sabotage operations against the Germans in advance of Overlord. Our landings in the Cherbourg Havre area have failed to gain a satisfactory foothold and I have withdrawn the troops. My decision to attack at this time and place was based on the best information available. The troops, the air and the navy did all that bravery and devotion to duty could do. If any blame or fault attaches to the attempt, it is mine alone. Liberation of France and Victory in Europe Eisenhower with Allied commanders following the signing of the German Instrument of Surrender at Reims. Once the coastal assault had succeeded, Eisenhower insisted on retaining personal control over the land battle strategy, and was immersed in the command and supply of multiple assaults through France on Germany. Field Marshal Montgomery insisted priority be given to his 21st Army Group's attack being made in the north, while Generals Bradley and Devers, 6th U.S. Army Group, insisted they be given priority in the center and south of the front. Respectively, Eisenhower worked tirelessly to address the demands of the rival commanders to optimize Allied forces, often by giving them tactical, though sometimes ineffective, latitude. Many historians conclude this delayed the Allied victory in Europe. However, due to Eisenhower's persistence, the pivotal supply port at Antwerp was successfully albeit belatedly, opened in late 1944, and victory became a more distinct probability. In recognition of his senior position in the Allied command, on December 20, 1944, he was promoted to General of the Army, equivalent to the rank of Field Marshal in most European armies. In this and the previous high commands he held, Eisenhower showed his great talents for leadership and diplomacy. Although he had never seen action himself, he won the respect of frontline commanders. He interacted adeptly with allies such as Winston Churchill, Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery and General Charles de Gaulle. 
He had serious disagreements with Churchill and Montgomery over questions of strategy, but these rarely upset his relationships with them. He dealt with Soviet Marshal Zhukov, his Russian counterpart, and they became good friends. The Germans launched a surprise counteroffensive in the Battle of the Bulge in December 1944, which the Allies turned back in early 1945 after Eisenhower repositioned his armies and improved weather allowed the Air Force to engage. In 1945, Eisenhower anticipated that someday an attempt would be made to recharacterize Nazi crimes as propaganda, Holocaust denial, and took steps against it by demanding extensive still and movie photographic documentation of Nazi death camps. After World War II, military governor in Germany and army chief of staff. Following the German unconditional surrender, Eisenhower was appointed military governor of the U.S. Occupation Zone based at the IG Farben building in Frankfurt am Main. He had no responsibility for the other three zones, controlled by Britain, France and the Soviet Union, except for the city of Berlin, which was managed by the four power authorities through the Allied command to as the governing body. Upon discovery of the Nazi concentration camps, he ordered camera crews to document evidence of the atrocities in them for use in the Nuremberg trials. He reclassified German prisoners of war, POWs, in U.S. custody as disarmed enemy forces, DEFs, who were no longer subject to the Geneva Convention. Eisenhower followed the orders laid down by the Joint Chiefs of Staff, JCS, in Directive JCS 1067, but softened them by bringing in 400 tons of food for civilians and allowing more fraternization. In November 1945, Eisenhower returned to Washington to replace Marshall as Chief of Staff of the Army. His main role was rapid demobilization of millions of soldiers, a slow job that was delayed by lack of shipping. Eisenhower was convinced in 1946 that the Soviet Union did not want war and that friendly relations could be maintained. He strongly supported the new United Nations and favored its involvement in the control of atomic bombs. However, in formulating policies regarding the atomic bomb and relations with the Soviets, Truman was guided by the U.S. State Department and ignored Eisenhower and the Pentagon. Indeed, Eisenhower had opposed the use of the atomic bomb against the Japanese, writing, first, the Japanese were ready to surrender and it wasn't necessary to hit them with that awful thing. Second, I hated to see our country be the first to use such a weapon. Quote. 1948 Presidential Election In June 1943, a visiting politician had suggested to Eisenhower that he might become President of the United States after the war, believing that a general should not participate in politics. One author later wrote that, figuratively speaking, as the election approached, other prominent citizens and politicians from both parties urged Eisenhower to run for president. In January 1948, after learning of plans in New Hampshire to elect delegates supporting him for the forthcoming Republican National Convention, Eisenhower stated through the Army that he was not available for and could not accept nomination to high political office. Lifelong professional soldiers, he wrote, in the absence of some obvious and overriding reason, President at Columbia University and NATO Supreme Commander, the Supreme Commanders of the Four Powers on June 5, 1945, in Berlin, Bernard Montgomery, Dwight D. Eisenhower, Georgi Zhukov and Jean de Latre de Dessigny. In 1948, Eisenhower became president of Columbia University, an Ivy League university in New York City. The assignment was described as not being a good fit in either direction. Eisenhower's stint as the president of Columbia University was punctuated by his activity within the Council on Foreign Relations. 
a study group he led as president concerning the political and military implications of the Marshall Plan and the American Assembly. Eisenhower's vision of a great cultural center where business, professional and governmental leaders could meet from time to time to discuss and reach conclusions concerning problems of a social and political nature. His biographer Blanche Wiesencook suggested that this period served as the political education of General Eisenhower, since he had to prioritize wide-ranging educational, administrative, and financial demands for the university. Through his involvement in the Council on Foreign Relations, he also gained exposure to economic analysis, which would become the bedrock of his understanding in economic policy. Whatever General Eisenhower knows about economics, he has learned at the study group meetings. One aide to Europe member claimed Eisenhower accepted the presidency of the university to expand his ability to promote the American form of democracy through education. He was clear on this point to the trustees involved in the search committee. He informed them that his main purpose was to promote the basic concepts of education in a democracy. As a result, he was, almost incessantly, devoted to the idea of the American Assembly, a concept he developed into an institution by the end of 1950. Within months of beginning his tenure as the president of the university, Eisenhower was requested to advise U.S. Secretary of Defense James Forrestal on the unification of the armed services. About six months after his appointment, he became the informal chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in Washington. Two months later he fell ill, and he spent over a month in recovery at the Augusta National Golf Club. He returned to his post in New York in mid-May, and in July 1949 took a two-month vacation out of state, because the American Assembly had begun to take shape. He traveled around the country during mid to late 1950 building financial support from Columbia Associates, an alumni association. Eisenhower was unknowingly building resentment and a reputation among the Columbia University faculty and staff as an absentee president who was using the university for his own interests. As a career military man, he naturally had little in common with the academics. The contacts gained through university and American Assembly fundraising activities would later become important supporters in Eisenhower's bid for the Republican Party nomination and the presidency. Meanwhile, Columbia University's liberal faculty members became disenchanted with the university president's ties to oil men and businessmen, including Leonard McCollum, the president of Continental Oil, Frank Abrams, the chairman of Standard Oil of New Jersey, Bob Clayburgh, the president of the King Ranch, H. J. Porter, a Texas oil executive, Bob Woodruff, the president of the Coca-Cola Corporation, and Clarence Francis, the chairman of General Foods. As the president of Columbia, Eisenhower gave voice and form to his opinions about the supremacy and difficulties of American democracy. His tenure marked his transformation from military to civilian leadership. His biographer Travis Beale Jacobs also suggested that the alienation of the Columbia faculty contributed to sharp intellectual criticism of him for many years. The trustees of Columbia University refused to accept Eisenhower's resignation in December 1950 when he took an extended leave from the university to become the supreme commander of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, and he was given operational command of NATO forces in Europe. Eisenhower retired from active service as an army general on May 31, 1952, and he resumed his presidency of Columbia. He held this position until January 20, 1953 when he became the President of the United States. NATO did not have strong bipartisan support in Congress at the time that Eisenhower assumed its military command. Eisenhower advised the participating European nations that it would be incumbent upon them to 
demonstrate their own commitment of troops and equipment to the NATO force before such would come from the war-weary United States. At home, Eisenhower was more effective in making the case for NATO in Congress than the Truman administration was. By the middle of 1951, American and European support for NATO was substantial enough to give it a genuine military power. Nevertheless, Eisenhower thought that NATO would become a truly European alliance, with the American and Canadian commitments ending after about 10 years. Presidential Campaign of 1952 President Truman, symbolizing a broad-based desire for an Eisenhower candidacy for president, again in 1951 pressed him to run for the office as a Democrat. It was at this time that Eisenhower voiced his disagreements with the Democratic Party and declared himself and his family to be Republicans. In the general election, against the advice of his advisors, Eisenhower insisted on campaigning in the South, refusing to surrender the region to the Democratic Party. The campaign strategy, dubbed K1C2, was to focus on attacking the Truman and Roosevelt administrations on three issues, Korea, communism and corruption. In an effort to accommodate the right, he stressed that the liberation of Eastern Europe should be by peaceful means only. He also distanced himself from his former boss President Truman. Two controversies during the campaign tested him and his staff, but did not affect the campaign. One involved a report that Nixon had improperly received funds from a secret trust. Nixon spoke out adroitly to avoid potential damage, but the matter permanently alienated the two candidates. The second issue centered on Eisenhower's relented decision to confront the controversial methods of Joseph McCarthy on his home turf in a Wisconsin appearance. Just two weeks prior to the election, Eisenhower vowed to go to Korea and end the war there. He promised to maintain a strong commitment against communism while avoiding the topic of NATO. Finally, he stressed a corruption-free, frugal administration at home. He defeated Democratic candidate Adlai Stevenson in a landslide, with an electoral margin of 442 to 89, marking the first Republican return to the White House in 20 years. Eisenhower was the last president born in the 19th century, and at age 62, was the oldest man elected president since James Buchanan in 1856. President Truman stood at 64 in 1948 as the incumbent president, having succeeded to the presidency in 1945 upon the death of Franklin Roosevelt. Eisenhower was the only general to serve as president in the 20th century and was the most recent president to have never held elected office prior to the presidency until Donald Trump. The other presidents who did not have prior elected office were Zachary Taylor, Ulysses S. Grant, William Howard Taft and Herbert Hoover. Election of 1956 the United States presidential election of 1956 was held on November 6, 1956. Eisenhower, the popular incumbent, successfully ran for re-election. The election was a rematch of 1952, as his opponent in 1956 was Adlai Stevenson, a former Illinois governor, whom Eisenhower had defeated four years earlier. Compared to the 1952 election, Eisenhower gained Kentucky, Louisiana, and West Virginia from Stevenson, while losing Missouri. This was the last presidential election before the admissions of Alaska and Hawaii, which would participate for the first time as states in the 1960 presidential election. It was also the last election in which any of the major candidates was born in the 19th century and it is the latest where both candidates were renominated for a rematch of the previous presidential election. Presidency Due to a complete estrangement between the two as a result of campaigning, Truman and Eisenhower had minimal discussions about the transition of administrations. Prior to his inauguration, Eisenhower led a meeting of advisors at Pearl Harbor addressing foremost issues 
agreed objective were to balance the budget during his term, to bring the Korean War to an end, to defend vital interests at lower cost through nuclear deterrent, and to end price and wage controls. Eisenhower made greater use of press conferences than any previous president, holding almost 200 over his two terms. While he saw the benefit of maintaining a good relationship with the press, he saw more value in them as a means of direct communication with the American people. Throughout his presidency, Eisenhower adhered to a political philosophy of dynamic conservatism. As the 1954 congressional elections approached, and it became evident that the Republicans were in danger of losing their thin majority in both houses, Eisenhower was among those blaming the old guard for the losses, and took up the charge to stop suspected efforts by the right wing to take control of the GOP. Eisenhower then articulated his position as a moderate, progressive Republican. I have just one purpose and that is to build up a strong progressive Republican Party in this country. If the right wing wants a fight, they are going to get it. Before I end up, either this Republican Party will reflect progressivism or I won't be with them anymore. Quote. Initially Eisenhower planned on serving only one term, but as with other decisions, he maintained a position of maximum flexibility in case leading Republicans wanted him to run again. During his recovery from a heart attack late in 1955, he huddled with his closest advisors to evaluate the GOP's potential candidates. The group, in addition to his doctor, concluded a second term was well advised, and he announced in February 1956 he would run again. Eisenhower valued the brief respites and the amenities of an office which he endowed with an arduous daily schedule. He made full use of his valet, chauffeur, and secretarial support. He rarely drove or dialed a phone number. He was an avid fisherman, golfer, painter, and bridge player, and preferred active rather than passive forms of entertainment. Interstate Highway System President Eisenhower delivered remarks about the need for a new highway program at Cadillac Square in Detroit on October 29, 1954. One of Eisenhower's enduring achievements was championing and signing the bill that authorized the interstate highway system in 1956. He justified the project through the Federal Aid Highway Act of 1956 as essential to American security during the Cold War. It was believed that large cities would be targets in a possible war. Hence the highways were designed to facilitate their evacuation and ease military maneuvers. Eisenhower's goal to create improved highways was influenced by difficulties encountered during his involvement in the U.S. Army's 1919 Transcontinental Motor Convoy. He was assigned as an observer for the mission, which involved sending a convoy of U.S. Army vehicles coast to coast foreign policy. In 1953, the Republican Party's old guard presented Eisenhower with a dilemma by insisting he disavow the Yalta agreements as beyond the constitutional authority of the executive branch. However, the death of Joseph Stalin in March 1953 made the matter a moot point. Nevertheless, the Cold War escalated during his presidency when the Soviet Union successfully tested a hydrogen bomb in late November 1955. Eisenhower, against the advice of Dulles, decided to initiate a disarmament proposal to the Soviets. In an attempt to make their refusal more difficult, he proposed that both sides agree to dedicate fissionable material away from weapons toward peaceful uses, such as power generation. This approach was labeled Adams for Peace. The U.N. speech was well received but the Soviets never acted upon it, due to an overarching concern for the greater stockpiles of nuclear weapons in the U.S. arsenal. Indeed, Eisenhower embarked upon a greater reliance on the use of nuclear weapons, while reducing conventional forces, and with them the overall defense budget. 
a policy formulated as a result of Project Solarium and expressed in NSC 162 halves. This approach became known as the New Look and was initiated with defense cuts in late 1953. In 1955 American nuclear arms policy became one aimed primarily at arms control as opposed to disarmament. The failure of negotiations over arms until 1955 was due mainly to the refusal of the Russians to permit any sort of inspections. In talks located in London that year, they expressed a willingness to discuss inspections. The tables were then turned on Eisenhower when he responded with an unwillingness on the part of the U.S. to permit inspections. In May of that year the Russians agreed to sign a treaty giving independence to Austria, and paved the way for a Geneva summit with the U.S., U.K., and France. In 1954, Eisenhower articulated the domino theory in his outlook towards communism in Southeast Asia and also in Central America. He believed that if the communists were allowed to prevail in Vietnam, this would cause a succession of countries to fall to communism, from Laos through Malaysia and Indonesia ultimately to India. Likewise, the fall of Guatemala would end with the fall of neighboring Mexico. With Eisenhower's leadership and Dulles's direction, CIA activities increased under the pretense of resisting the spread of communism in poorer countries. Space Race Eisenhower and the CIA had known since at least January 1957, nine months before Sputnik, that Russia had the capability to launch a small payload into orbit and was likely to do so within a year. He may also privately have welcomed the Russian satellite for its legal implications. By launching a satellite, Russia had in effect acknowledged that space was open to anyone who could access it without needing permission from other nations. On the whole, Eisenhower's support of the nation's fledgling space program was officially modest until the Soviet launch of Sputnik in 1957, gaining the Cold War enemy enormous prestige around the world. He then launched a national campaign that funded not just space exploration but a major strengthening of science and higher education. The Eisenhower administration determined to adopt a non-aggressive policy that would allow spacecrafts of any state to overfly all states, a region free of military posturing and launch Earth satellites to explore space. Fear spread through the United States that the Soviet Union would invade and spread communism. So Eisenhower wanted to not only create a surveillance satellite to detect any threats but ballistic missiles that would protect the United States. In strategic terms, it was Eisenhower who devised the American basic strategy of nuclear deterrence based upon the triad of B-52 bombers, land-based intercontinental ballistic missiles, ICBMs, and Polaris submarine-launched ballistic missiles, SLBMs. NASA planners projected that human spaceflight would pull the United States ahead in the space race, as well as accomplishing their long-time goal. However, in 1960, an ad hoc panel on man in space concluded that man in space cannot be justified and was too costly. Korean War, China and Taiwan in late 1952 Eisenhower went to Korea and discovered a military and political stalemate. Once in office, when the Chinese began a build-up in the Kaesong Sanctuary, he threatened to use nuclear force if an armistice was not concluded. His earlier military reputation in Europe was effective with the Chinese. In July 1953, an armistice took effect with Korea divided along approximately the same boundary as in 1950. The armistice and boundary remain in effect today, with American soldiers stationed there to guarantee it. The armistice concludes despite opposition from Secretary Dulles, South Korean President Syngman Rhee, and also within Eisenhower's party has been described by biographer Ambrose as the greatest achievement of the administration.
Eisenhower had the insight to realize that unlimited war in the nuclear age was unthinkable, and limited war unwinnable. A point of emphasis in Ike's campaign had been his endorsement of a policy of liberation from communism as opposed to a policy of containment. This remained his preference despite the armistice with Korea. Eisenhower continued Truman's policy of recognizing the Republic of China, based in Formosa, Taiwan, as the legitimate government of China, not the Beijing regime. There were localized flare-ups when the Red Army began shelling the islands of Kamoi and Matsu in September 1954. Eisenhower received recommendations embracing every variation of response to the aggression of the Chinese communists. He thought it essential to have every possible option available to him as the crisis unfolded. The Sino-American Mutual Defense Treaty with Taiwan was signed in December 1954. He requested and secured from Congress their Formosa Resolution in January 1955 which gave Eisenhower unprecedented power in advance to use military force at any level of his choosing in defense of Formosa and the Pescador was. The resolution bolstered the morale of the Chinese nationalists and signaled to Beijing that the U.S. was committed to holding the line. Eisenhower openly threatened the Chinese with use of nuclear weapons, authorizing a series of bomb tests labeled Operation Teapot. Nevertheless, he left the Chinese communists guessing as to the exact nature of his nuclear response. This allowed Eisenhower to accomplish all of his objectives. The end of this communist encroachment, the retention of the islands by the Chinese nationalists and continued peace. By the end of 1954 Eisenhower's military and foreign policy experts, the NSC, JCS and State Department, had unanimously urged him, on no less than five occasions, to launch an atomic attack against China. Yet he consistently refused to do so and felt a distinct sense of accomplishment in having sufficiently confronted communism while keeping world peace, the Middle East and Eisenhower Doctrine. Even before he was inaugurated Eisenhower accepted a request from the British government to restore the Shah, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, to power. He therefore authorized the Central Intelligence Agency to overthrow Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh. In November 1956, Eisenhower forced an end to the combined British, French and Israeli invasion of Egypt in response to the Suez Crisis, receiving praise from Egyptian President Gamal Abdel Nasser. Simultaneously he condemned the brutal Soviet invasion of Hungary in response to the Hungarian Revolution of 1956. He publicly disavowed his allies at the United Nations, and used financial and diplomatic pressure to make them withdraw from Egypt. Eisenhower and Vice President Richard Nixon with their host, King Saud of Saudi Arabia, at the Mayflower Hotel. After the Suez Crisis the United States became the protector of unstable friendly governments in the Middle East via the Eisenhower Doctrine, designed by Secretary of State Dulles. It held the U.S. would be prepared to use armed force. Eisenhower applied the doctrine in 1957-58 by dispensing economic aid to shore up the Kingdom of Jordan and by encouraging Syria's neighbors to consider military operations against it. More dramatically, in July 1958, he sent 15,000 Marines and soldiers to Lebanon as part of Operation Blue Bat, a non-combat peacekeeping mission to stabilize the pro-Western government and to prevent a radical revolution from sweeping over that country. The mission proved a success and the Marines departed three months later. The deployment came in response to the urgent request of Lebanese President Camille Shimoun after sectarian violence had erupted in the country. Washington considered the military intervention successful since it brought about regional stability, weakened Soviet influence, and intimidated the Egyptian and Syrian governments whose anti-West political position had hardened after the Suez Crisis. 
Most Arab countries were skeptical about the Eisenhower Doctrine, because they considered Zionist imperialism the real danger. However, they did take the opportunity to obtain free money and weapons. Egypt and Syria, supported by the Soviet Union, openly opposed the initiative. However, Egypt received American aid until the Six-Day War in 1967. As the Cold War deepened, Dulles sought to isolate the Soviet Union by building regional alliances of nations against it. Critics sometimes called it Pactomania. Southeast Asia Early in 1953, the French asked Eisenhower for help in French Indochina against the Communists, supplied from China, who were fighting the First Indochina War. Eisenhower sent LT. General John W. Iron Mike O. Daniel de Vietnam to study and assess the French forces there. Eisenhower did provide France with bombers and non-combat personnel. After a few months with no success by the French, he added other aircraft to drop napalm for clearing purposes. Further requests for assistance from the French were agreed to but only on conditions Eisenhower knew were impossible to meet. Question mark. Allied participation and congressional approval. Eisenhower responded to the French defeat with the formation of the CETO, Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, alliance with the U.K., France, New Zealand and Australia in defense of Vietnam against communism. At that time the French and Chinese were convened Geneva peace talks. Eisenhower agreed the U.S. would participate only as an observer, after France and the Communists agreed to a partition of Vietnam, Eisenhower rejected the agreement, offering military and economic aid to southern Vietnam. In late 1954, Gen. J. Lawton Collins was made ambassador to Free Vietnam. The term South Vietnam came into use in 1955, effectively elevating the country to sovereign status. Collins' instructions were to support the leader Godin Diem in subverting communism by helping him to build an army and wage a military campaign. In the years that followed, Eisenhower increased the number of U.S. military advisors in South Vietnam to 900 men. After the election of November 1960, Eisenhower in briefing with John F. Kennedy pointed out the communist threat in Southeast Asia as requiring prioritization in the next administration. Eisenhower told Kennedy he considered Laos the cork in the bottle with regard to the regional threat. 1960 U-2 Incident On May 1, 1960, a U.S. one-man U-2 spy plane was reportedly shot down at high altitude over Soviet Union airspace. The flight was made to gain photo intelligence before the scheduled opening of an East-West Summit conference, which had been scheduled in Paris. Fifteen days later, Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev announced that a spy plane had been shot down but intentionally made no reference to the pilot. As a result, the Eisenhower administration, thinking the pilot had died in the crash, authorized the release of a cover story claiming that the plane was a weather research aircraft, which had unintentionally strayed into Soviet airspace after the pilot had radioed difficulties with his oxygen equipment while flying over Turkey. The 1964 Power Paris Summit with Eisenhower, Nikita Khrushchev, Harold Macmillan and Charles de Gaulle collapsed because of the incident. Eisenhower refused to accede to Khrushchev's demands that he apologize. Therefore, Khrushchev would not take part in the summit. Up until this event, Eisenhower felt he had been making progress towards better relations with the Soviet Union. Nuclear arms reduction and Berlin were to have been discussed at the summit. Eisenhower stated it had all been ruined because of that stupid YouTube business. The affair was an embarrassment for United States prestige. Further, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee held a lengthy inquiry into the U-2 incident. Civil Rights While well, President Truman had begun the process of desegregating the armed forces in 1948, 
Actual implementation had been slow. Eisenhower made clear his stance in his first State of the Union address in February 1953, saying, I propose to use whatever authority exists in the office of the President to end segregation in the District of Columbia, including the federal government, and any segregation in the armed forces. When Robert B. Anderson, Eisenhower's first Secretary of the Navy, argued that the U.S. Navy must recognize the customs and usages prevailing in certain geographic areas of our country, which the Navy had no part in creating. Eisenhower overruled him. We have not taken and we shall not take a single backward step. There must be no second-class citizens in this country. Quote. The administration declared racial discrimination a national security issue as communists around the world used the racial discrimination and history of violence in the U.S. as a point of propaganda attack. Eisenhower told District of Columbia officials to make Washington a model for the rest of the country in integrating black and white public school children. In 1957, the state of Arkansas refused to honor a federal court order to integrate their public school system stemming from the Brown decision. Eisenhower demanded that Arkansas Governor Orville Faubus obey the court order. When Faubus balked, the president placed the Arkansas National Guard under federal control and sent in the 101st Airborne Division. They escorted and protected nine black students' entry to Little Rock Central High School, an all-white public school, for the first time since the Reconstruction era. Relations with Congress Eisenhower had a Republican Congress for only his first two years in office. In the Senate, the Republican majority was by a one-vote margin. Senator Robert A. Taft assisted the president greatly in working with the old guard, and was sorely missed when his death, in July 1953, left Eisenhower with his successor William Noland, whom Eisenhower disliked. This prevented Eisenhower from openly condemning Joseph McCarthy's highly criticized methods against communism. To facilitate relations with Congress, Eisenhower decided to ignore McCarthy's controversies and thereby deprive them of more energy from involvement of the White House. This position drew criticism from a number of corners. Nevertheless, he refused. Among Eisenhower's objectives in not directly confronting McCarthy was to prevent McCarthy from dragging the Atomic Energy Commission, AAEC, into McCarthy's witch hunt for communists, which would interfere with, and perhaps delay, the AEC's important work on H-bombs. The administration had discovered through its own investigations that one of the leading scientists on the AEC, J. Robert Oppenheimer, had urged that the H-bomb work be delayed. Eisenhower removed him from the agency and revoked his security clearance, though he knew this would create fertile ground for McCarthy. In May 1955, McCarthy threatened to issue subpoenas to White House personnel. Eisenhower was furious, and issued an order as follows. It is essential to efficient and effective administration that employees of the executive branch be in a position to be completely candid in advising with each other on official matters. It is not in the public interest that any of their conversations or communications, or any documents or reproductions, concerning such advice be disclosed. Quote, this was an unprecedented step by Eisenhower to protect communication beyond the confines of a cabinet meeting, and soon became a tradition known as executive privilege. Ike's denial of McCarthy's access to his staff reduced McCarthy's hearings to rants about trivial matters, and contributed to his ultimate downfall. In early 1954, the Old Guard put forward a constitutional amendment, called the Bricker Amendment, which would curtail international agreements by the chief executive, such as the Yalta Agreements. Eisenhower opposed the measure. The Democrats gained a majority in both houses in the 1954 election. Speaker Martin concluded that Eisenhower worked too much through subordinates in dealing with 
Congress, with results, often the reverse of what he has desired because members of Congress resent having some young fellow who was picked up by the White House without ever having been elected to office himself coming around and telling them, the chief wants this. The administration never made use of many Republicans of consequence whose services in one form or another would have been available for the asking. Quote, Judicial appointments Supreme Court Whitaker was unsuited for the role and soon retired. Stewart and Harlan were conservative Republicans, while Brennan was a Democrat who became a leading voice for liberalism. In the next few years Warren led the court in a series of liberal decisions that revolutionized the role of the court. Other courts In addition to his five Supreme Court appointments, Eisenhower appointed 45 judges to the United States Courts of Appeals, and 129 judges to the United States District Courts. States admitted to the Union Health issues Eisenhower began smoking cigarettes at West Point, often two or three packs a day. Eisenhower stated that he gave. As a consequence of his heart attack, Eisenhower developed a left ventricular aneurysm, which was in turn the cause of a mild stroke on November 25, 1957. This incident occurred during a cabinet meeting when Eisenhower suddenly found himself unable to speak or move his right hand. The stroke had caused an aphasia. The president also suffered from Crohn's disease. The last three years of Eisenhower's second term in office were ones of relatively good health. Eventually after leaving the White House, he suffered several additional and ultimately crippling heart attacks. End of Presidency The 22nd Amendment to the U.S. Constitution was ratified in 1951, and it set term limits to the presidency of two terms. It stipulated that Harry S. Truman, the incumbent at the time, would not be affected by the amendment, after he had been elected to his second presidential term in 1956. Eisenhower became the first U.S. president constitutionally prevented from running for re-election to the office, having served the maximum two terms. Eisenhower was also the first outgoing president to come under the protection of the former President's Act. Two living former presidents, Herbert Hoover and Harry S. Truman, left office before the act was passed. Under the act, Eisenhower was entitled to receive a lifetime pension, state-provided staff and a Secret Service detail. In the 1960 election to choose his successor, Eisenhower endorsed his own vice president, Republican Richard Nixon, against Democrat John F. Kennedy. He told friends, I will do almost anything to avoid turning my chair and country over to Kennedy. Quote, on January 17, 1961, Eisenhower gave his final televised address to the nation from the Oval Office. He elaborated, We recognize the imperative need for this development. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals, so that security and liberty may prosper together. Quote, because of legal issues related to holding a military rank while in a civilian office, Eisenhower had resigned his permanent commission as General of the Army before entering the office of President of the United States. Upon completion of his presidential term, his commission was reactivated by Congress and Eisenhower again was commissioned a five-star general in the United States Army. Retirement, Death and Funeral Groves of Dwight D. Eisenhower, Dowd Dwight Ecke, Eisenhower and Mamie Eisenhower in Abilene, Kansas. Eisenhower retired to the place where he and Mamie had spent much of their post-war time a working farm adjacent to the battlefield at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, 70 miles from his ancestral home in Elizabethville, Dauphin County, 
Pennsylvania. In 1967 the Eisenhowers donated the Gettysburg Farm to the National Park Service. In retirement, Eisenhower did not completely retreat from political life. He flew to San Antonio, where he had been stationed years earlier, to support John W. Good, the unsuccessful Republican candidate against the Democrat Henry B. Gonzalez for Texas' 20th congressional district seat. On the morning of March 28, 1969, at the age of 78, Eisenhower died in Washington, B. C. of congestive heart failure at Walter Reed Army Medical Center. The following day his body was moved to the Washington National Cathedral's Bethlehem Chapel, where he lay in repose for 28 hours. On March 30, his body was brought by Kaizen to the United States Capitol where he lay in state in the Capitol Rotunda. On March 31, Eisenhower's body was returned to the National Cathedral, where he was given an Episcopal Church funeral service. That evening, Eisenhower's body was placed onto a train en route to Abilene, Kansas, the last time a funeral train has been used as part of funeral proceedings of an American president. Some men are considered great because they lead great armies or they lead powerful nations. For eight years now, Dwight Eisenhower has neither commanded an army nor led a nation, and yet he remained through his final days the world's most admired and respected man, truly the first citizen of the world. Legacy and Memory In the immediate years after Eisenhower left office, his reputation declined. He was widely seen by critics as an inactive, uninspiring, golf-playing president compared to his vigorous young successor, John F. Kennedy, who was 26 years his junior. Despite his unprecedented use of army troops to enforce a federal desegregation order at Central High School in Little Rock, Eisenhower was criticized for his reluctance to support the civil rights movement to the degree that activists wanted. Eisenhower also attracted criticism for his handling of the 1960 U-2 incident and the associated international embarrassment for the Soviet Union's perceived leadership in the nuclear arms race and the space race, and for his failure to publicly oppose McCarthyism. In particular, Eisenhower was criticized for failing to defend George Marshall from attacks by Joseph McCarthy though he privately deplored McCarthy's tactics and claims. Historians long ago abandoned the view that Eisenhower's was a failed presidency. He did, after all, end the Korean War without getting into any others. He stabilized, and did not escalate, the Soviet-American rivalry. He strengthened European alliances while withdrawing support from European colonialism. He rescued the Republican Party from isolationism and McCarthyism. He maintained prosperity, balanced the budget, promoted technological innovation, facilitated, if reluctantly, the civil rights movement and warned, in the most memorable farewell address since Washington's, of a military, industrial complex that could endanger the nation's liberties. Not until Reagan would another president leave office with so strong a sense of having accomplished what he set out to do. Although conservatism in politics was strong during the 1950s and Eisenhower generally espoused conservative sentiments, his administration concerned itself mostly with foreign affairs, an area in which the career military president had more knowledge and pursued a hands-off domestic policy. Eisenhower looked to moderation and cooperation as a means of governance. Although he sought to slow or contain the New Deal and other federal programs, he did not attempt to repeal them outright, and in doing so was popular among the liberal wing of the Republican Party. President John F. Kennedy meets with Eisenhower at Camp David, April 22, 1961, three days after the Bay of Pigs invasion. Since the 19th century, many if not all presidents were assisted by a central figure or gatekeeper, sometimes described as the president's private secretary, sometimes with no official title at all. Eisenhower formalized this role, 
Introducing the office of White House Chief of Staff? Question mark. An idea he borrowed from the United States Army. Every president after Lyndon Johnson has also appointed staff to this position. Initially, Gerald Ford and Jimmy Carter tried to operate without a chief of staff, but each eventually appointed one. As president, Eisenhower also initiated the up or out policy that still prevails in the U.S. military, whereby officers who are passed over for promotion twice are usually honorably but quickly discharged to make way for younger, more able officers. As an army officer, Eisenhower had been stuck at the rank of major for 16 years between the two world wars. On December 20, 1944, Eisenhower was appointed to the rank of General of the Army, placing him in the company of George Marshall, Henry, Hap Arnold, and Douglas MacArthur, the only four men to achieve the rank in World War II, and along with Omar Bradley, one of only five men to achieve the rank since the August 5, 1888 death of Philip Sheridan, and the only five men to hold the rank as a five-star general. The rank was created by an act of Congress on a temporary basis when Public Law 78-482 was passed. On 14 December 1944, it was created to give the most senior American commanders parity of rank with their British counterparts holding the ranks of Field Marshal and Admiral of the Fleet. This second general of the Army rank is not the same as the post-Civil War era version because of its purpose and five stars. Eisenhower founded People to People International in 1956, based on his belief that citizen interaction would promote cultural interaction and world peace. The program includes a student ambassador component, which sends American youth on educational trips to other countries. Frank Gasparro's obverse design, left, and reverse design, right of the Presidential Medal of Appreciation Award during Eisenhower's official visit to the state of Hawaii from June 20, 25, 1960. During his second term as president, Eisenhower distinctively preserved his presidential gratitude by awarding individuals a special memento. This memento was a series of specially designed U.S. Mint Presidential Appreciation Medals. Eisenhower presented the medal as an expression of his appreciation and the medal as a keepsake. Reminder for the recipient. The development of the appreciation medals was initiated by the White House and executed by the Bureau of the Mint through the U.S. Mint in Philadelphia. The medals were struck from September 1958 through October 1960. A total of 20 designs are catalogued with a total mintage of 9. 858. Each of the designs incorporates the text, with appreciation, or, with personal and official gratitude, accompanied with Eisenhower's initials, D, D, E, or facsimile signature. The design also incorporates location, date, and or significant event. Prior to the end of his second term as president, 1. 451 medals were turned into the Bureau of the Mint and destroyed tributes and memorials. Eisenhower is remembered for his role in World War II, the creation of the interstate highway system and ending the Korean War. He is less remembered for helping negotiate the withdrawal of all Soviet and Allied troops from Austria in exchange for that country's commitment to Swiss-style neutrality, which may be considered the first thaw in the Cold War. The interstate highway system is officially known as the Dwight D. Eisenhower National System of Interstate and Defense Highways in his honor. It was inspired in part by Eisenhower's own army experiences in World War II, where he recognized the advantages of the Autobahn system in Germany. The British A4-class steam locomotive No. 4496, renumbered 60,008, Golden Shuttle was renamed Dwight D. Eisenhower in 1946. It is preserved at the National Railroad Museum in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Dwight D. 
Eisenhower School for National Security and Resource Strategy is a senior war college of the Department of Defense's National Defense University in Washington, D.C. Eisenhower graduated from this school when it was previously known as the Army Industrial College. The school's building on Fort Leslie J. McNair, when it was known as the Industrial College of the Armed Forces, was dedicated as Eisenhower Hall in 1960. Eisenhower College was a small, liberal arts college chartered in Seneca Falls, New York, in 1965, with classes beginning in 1968. Financial problems forced the school to fall under the management of the Rochester Institute of Technology in 1979. Its last class graduated in 1983. Eisenhower Hall, the Cadet Activities Building at West Point, was completed in 1974. In 1983, the Eisenhower Monument was unveiled at West Point. Eisenhower was honored on a U.S. $1 coin, minted from 1971 to 1978. His centenary was honored on a commemorative dollar coin issued in 1990. In 1969, four major record companies, question mark, ABC Records, MGM Records, Buddha Records and Cademan Audio, released tribute albums in Eisenhower's honor. The Dwight D. Eisenhower Army Medical Center, located at Fort Gordon near Augusta, Georgia, was named in his honor. In 1983, the Eisenhower Institute was founded in Washington, D.C. as a policy institute to advance Eisenhower's intellectual and leadership legacies. In 1989, U.S. Ambassador Charles Price and British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher dedicated a bronze statue of Eisenhower in Grosvenor Square, London. The statue is located in front of the current U.S. Embassy in London and across from the former command center for the Allied Expeditionary Force. During World War II, offices Eisenhower occupied during the war. In 1999, the United States Congress created the Dwight D. Eisenhower Memorial Commission to create an enduring national memorial in Washington, D.C. In 2009, the commission chose the architect Frank Gehry to design the memorial. On May 7, 2002, the old Executive Office Building was officially renamed the Eisenhower Executive Office Building. This building is part of the White House complex and is west of the West Wing. It currently houses a number of executive offices, including ones for the vice president and his or her spouse. A county park in East Meadow, New York, Long Island, is named in his honor. Eisenhower State Park on Lake Texoma near his birthplace of Denison is named in his honor. His birthplace is currently operated by the state of Texas as the Eisenhower Birthplace State Historic Site. Since 1980, the National Park Service has allowed visitors to the Eisenhower Farm adjacent to the Gettysburg Battlefield. Mount Eisenhower was named in the presidential range of the White Mountains in New Hampshire, Wichita Dwight D. Eisenhower National Airport in Wichita, Kansas. The FAA changed the name in 2014 so it would be included in new 2015 maps, and the official dedication occurred in April 2015. The Eisenhower Golf Club at the United States Air Force Academy, a 36-hole facility featuring the blue and silver courses, which is ranked no. 1 among DOD courses, is named in his honor. Eisenhower Park on Washington Square in Newport, Rhode Island, dedicated by President Eisenhower in 1960. The 18th hole at Cherry Hills Country Club, near Denver, is named in his honor. Eisenhower was a longtime member of the club, which operated one of his favorite courses. A loblolly pine, known as the Eisenhower Pine, was located on Augusta's 17th hole, approximately 210 yards from the Masters tee. Eisenhower, an Augusta national member, hit the tree so many times that, at a 1956 club meeting, he proposed that it be cut down. 
not wanting to offend the president. The club's chairman, Clifford Roberts, immediately adjourned the meeting rather than reject the request. The tree was removed in 2014 after an ice storm caused it significant damage. During a visit to Augusta National, Eisenhower returned from a walk through the woods on the eastern part of the grounds and informed Clifford Roberts that he had found a perfect place to build a dam if the club would. Like a fish pond, Ike's Pond was built and named, and the dam is located just where I Eisenhower said it should be. In 2015, he was honored with a Golden Palm Star on the Walk of Stars in Palm Springs, California. Awards and Decorations the coat of arms granted to Eisenhower upon his incorporation as a Knight of the Order of the Elephant in 1950. The anvil represents the fact that his name is derived from the German for Iron Hewer. Other honors An apartment at the top of the Colzine Castle in Scotland was given to General of the Army Dwight D. Eisenhower in recognition of his role as Supreme Commander of the Allied Forces in Europe during the Second World War. The general first visited Colzine Castle in 1946 and stayed there four times, including once while President of the United States. An Eisenhower exhibition occupies one of the rooms, with mementos of his lifetime. In January 1946, the Metropolitan Museum of Art named Eisenhower an honorary fellow for life in recognition of his efforts to recover art looted by the Nazis during World War II. In 1966, Eisenhower was the second person awarded Civitan International's World Citizenship Award. In 2009, he was named to the World Golf Hall of Fame in the Lifetime Achievement category for his contributions to the sport. Eisenhower's name was given to a variety of streets, avenues, etc in cities around the world, including Paris, France. Promotions Note, question mark, Eisenhower relinquished his active duty status when he became president on January 20, 1953. He was returned to active duty when he left office eight years later. Family Tree General Biographies Ambrose Stephen Eisenhower, Volume 1, Soldier, General of the Army, President-Elect, New York, Simon & Schuster, Creek, Joanne P., Ed. Dwight D., Eisenhower, Soldier, President, Statesman, 24 Essays by Scholars, ISBN 0-313-25955-0. Military Career Ambrose, Stephen E., the Supreme Commander, The War Years of Dwight D. Eisenhower Excerpt and Text Search Ambrose, Stephen E., The Victors, Eisenhower and His Boys, The Men of World War II, New York, Simon & Schuster, ISBN 0-684-85628-X. Eisenhower, David, Eisenhower at War 1943-1945. New York, Random House, ISBN 0-394-41237-0. A detailed study by his grandson, Irish, Gary E., apt pupil, Dwight Eisenhower in the 1930 Industrial Mobilization Plan. The Journal of Military History 70, 131, 61 online in Project Muse. Jordan, Jonathan W., Brothers Rivals Victors. Eisenhower, Patton, Bradley, and the partnership that drove the Allied conquest in Europe. NAL, Caliber. ISBN 0-451-23212-7. OCLC 617,565,184. Jordan, Jonathan W., American Warlords. How Roosevelt's High Command Led America to Victory in World War II. NAL, Caliber. ISBN 978-0-451-41457-1. OCLC 892458610. Pogue, 
Forest C. The Supreme Command. Office of the Chief of Military History. Department. Of the Army. OCLC 1247005. Weigley, Russell. Eisenhower's Lieutenants. The Campaign of France and Germany. 1944. 1945. Indiana University Press. ISBN 0-253-13333-5. OCLC 6863111 Civilian Career Bowie, Robert R. and Immerman, Richard H. Waging Peace How Eisenhower Shaped an Enduring Cold War Strategy Oxford University Press ISBN 0-19-506264-7 Chernus, Ira, Apocalypse Management Eisenhower and the Discourse of National Insecurity. Stanford University Press. ISBN 978-0-8047-5807-9, OCLC 105454244. David Paul T. Ed. Presidential Nominating Politics in 1952. 5 Vols. Johns Hopkins Press. OCLC 519846. Gelman, Erwin F., The President and the Apprentice, Eisenhower and Nixon, 1952-1961, New Haven, C.T., Yale University Press, ISBN 978-0-300-18105-0, OCLC 9105043-24. Greenstein, Fred I., The Hidden Hand Presidency, Eisenhower as Leader, Basic Books, ISBN 0-465-029485, OCLC 8765635. Harris, Douglas B., Dwight Eisenhower and the New Deal, The Politics of Preemption, Presidential Studies Quarterly, Volume 27, 1997. Harris, Seymour E., The Economics of the Political Parties, with special attention to President Eisenhower and Kennedy. OCLC 174566. Medhurst, Martin J., Dwight D., Eisenhower, Strategic Communicator, Westport, CT, Greenwood Press. ISBN 0-313-26140-7, OCLC 267-64309. Pock, Chester J., and Richardson, Elmo, Presidency of Dwight D. Eisenhower, University Press of Kansas, ISBN 0-7006-0436-7, OCLC 2230749. Prados, John, Eisenhower and the Cold War Arms Race, Open Skis and the Military-Industrial Complex, Journal of Cold War Studies, Watery, David M., Diplomacy at the Brink, Eisenhower, Churchill and Eden in the Cold War, Baton Rouge, L.A., Louisiana State University Press.